Welcome to another edition of the BCSN Sports Wrap, a special BCSN conversation with college football and black college football Hall of Famer, Coach Joe Taylor. Coach Taylor, welcome to the Sports Wrap. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you and how are your family and everyone there at Virginia Union doing? Well, first of all, thanks a lot, Brian, for reaching out. Uh, and congratulations to all that you guys do, just helping to tell our story. But everybody's good. Um, this, this virus is, is serious, but uh, we, we're trying to be, uh, you know, obedient and everybody's fine and thanks for asking. Before we get into talking about some of the more recent news, uh, of course, you were recently um, selected to be a part of the college football playoff committee. Let's, let me start a little bit by asking about just the challenges and maybe give us some thought about uh, a little background uh, behind the scenes on, on how this pandemic has really changed some of the uh, processes and maybe uh, procedures of, of things at Virginia Union and, and maybe what you expect to come out of this when we do get into a safer place? Well, yes, um, certainly uh, it's unprecedented. Uh, I never thought in my lifetime that I could not walk out and see somebody practicing, whether it's <laughs> basketball, football, or whatever, uh, you know, but again, it's, it's real. And it has um, actually ha created for us a transition from campus base to virtual. Uh, of course, we do have uh, maybe about 200 students on campus and we do what we call re-socialization. And re-socialization is merely, merely small group settings, whether it's concept teaching, whether it's strength and conditioning, whether it's walkthroughs, uh, but it's changed the landscape, but it's created, uh, I think, a sense of bonding, uh, a realization of what's really important in life, uh, because I think because of Zoom and team, uh, you see a lot more meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one with my family and uh, I see my family more now than I did in the past. So uh, it's always, you know, some silver linings. And I think as we return to some facsimile of normalcy, I don't think we'll ever go back to what we did and call normal. Mm -hmm. But all of that's good because I've seen a lot of creativity uh, throughout, not just here at Virginia Union, but through, throughout our nation, really. You mentioned that key word there about creativity. And, and I think one of the things personally that I've noticed is it's really forced uh, many athletic programs to really change the way they, they market and, and reach out and uh, to not only their alumni and fans, but really publicize their programs. What kind of things have you seen and, and what maybe things are, are being worked on behind the scenes at Virginia Union in terms of technology that we hopefully will be able to, to see uh, on a regular basis come future seasons? Well, uh, that word streaming. Yes. Um, it's gonna take a different platform in reference to uh, the things that we were looking at. If we can't have uh, in-person audiences, uh, we will get the cutouts and maybe put the picture of the person who bought the uh, season pass uh, as an option, 
Uh, and then of course, uh, as you stream, that might be a new way now of having your sponsors, uh, you know, to, but again, it's all, it's creativity um, with the idea of the vaccines being available. Um, I know this spring is pretty much out in terms of competition. Okay. Uh, some might attempt to, but uh, we are hoping that by fall of 2021, uh, that the options will be there to move back to some sense of, of normalcy, or as, as you said, use that creativity to uh, through technology. Uh, and of course, our recruiting now is mainly technology. Um, uh, coaches, when they meet with their uh, staff, uh, or when they meet with recruits, or when they meet with their teams, um, you know, you that Zoom and uh, team. Um, only thing I don't like about it, uh, Brian, is that people can catch you at home too, you know, because <laughs> you have no excuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. But um, and then of course, being a VP now, you know, we always have these cabinet meetings, and they can go six, seven hours per day. Uh, but again, it's uh, I think the idea of cleansing, uh, we were able to sit as a nation and kind of get a real view of what our country is like in terms of, um, you know, the supremacy concept, the BLM concept. Um, everybody has had an opportunity to really kind of view where we are as a nation and give all of us an opportunity to search our conscience and decide which way we want to go. What Speaking of that, what, what has impressed you or maybe encouraged you about young people or maybe the future as you've watched your student athletes and, and other student athletes or just students in general, um, the way they've responded and the way they've reacted to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement or, or just where they are in history, which is probably not too different. Well, it is different than maybe your, when you grew up, when you were in college, but it, it's a lot of the same things that you went through uh, as a college student, I'm sure these young people uh, are, are going through. What, what have you what, what have you seen from young people and, and your student athletes that has uh, impressed you and encouraged you? Well, and that's a good way to encourage because, you know, racism, bigotry, that's not new. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been here. But I think because of the ability or when we were kind of shut down as a nation, I think it helped to bring the idea that it's still real. Uh, our young people really, I don't think had focused on uh, the kind of society that we live in, but because uh, there was no classes, uh, you know, it, no campus-based classes, uh, there was a lot of scenes on TV, um, and they were able to see mm -hmm. that, uh, and now not just African-Americans, but non-African-Americans uh, who probably uh, in their focused world, this was kind of outside of their psyche, and they were able to see it and to see the marches, uh, you know, all nationalities, uh, ethnicities were together in the streets marching. Uh, I think for the first time, the conscious level is high enough that it's just not us now who see it or experienced it, uh, but others as well can say, oh my God, this is not right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, it's going to, if it's going to ever be some legislation to uh, get rid of systemic racism, I think it's going to happen now. Yes, sir. Um, let me transition a little towards the recent uh, selection of yourself towards the uh, college football playoff committee, uh, which, which you are now the the first, if I'm not mistaken, um, you could say first division two administrator to be a part of this committee, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Well, yeah, uh, first division two, but I also, uh, a first athletic administrator from an HBCU. Yes, yes, um, definitely. To represent um, this committee. 
and certainly very, very humbling. I'm very honored. And to, uh, I got a call from Bill Hancock uh, just prior to the holidays. And uh, in 2019, in December 8th, I think it was, uh, I was in New York to be inducted into the college, well, the uh, National Football Foundation College Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Bill Hancock, who is the, per, uh, the chairman of this committee, uh, he was in the audience and I was asked to give the response uh, for all of the inductees. And I think this is probably when he had an opportunity to uh, know who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also reached out to, uh, you know, Dr. Thomas, the commissioner of the, CI, um, of the MEAC uh, and others. Uh, and then you had to do a background check. But I think really it's the body of work uh, over the 40 years that um, we were able to be a part of what I call the greatest profession in America, and that's coaching. Mm -hmm. Because on a daily basis, you have the opportunity to impact lives in a very positive way. And I think um, going into the Hall of Fame, in fact, not just the um, College National uh, Hall of Fame, but also uh, Shaq Harris and, of course, Doug Williams have done a great job of uh, recognizing and creating the Black coaches, uh, Black football coaches Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's, um, you know, to me, again, to be on the bus with Eddie Robinson and, and Jake Gaither, uh, you know, it's just, it's, again, just humbling. And I think that's what really initiated the conversation, uh, the initial call. Uh, and then, of course, being on the board of trustees for the American Football Coaches Association mm -hmm. and rising to the position of president in and, and, and 2001. Uh, all of that body of work and uh, with integrity, uh, I think, created this opportunity. Yeah, well, definitely. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and again, congratulations on that. Uh, so w one of my questions or one of my thoughts as just this past year with the um, college football playoff uh, selections, which uh, just uh, finished this past year with Alabama winning, there's been a lot of very public criticism of the selection process of the teams. And mostly of that has come from, whether it be fans or media for, for non-Power Five, what we call the Power Five uh, programs. So uh, I, I'm curious, what have, you, what have you seen from your perspective and how can this process in the future be set up or established so that these non-Power 5 schools actually feel like they actually have an opportunity to win a national championship? Because that's one of the things that I often hear, whether it be from head coaches or athletic directors of these non-Power 5, is that they don't have a chance. What would you, what would you say or, or what are your thoughts as you, you look forward to the next three years of being a part of this committee? Well, again, Brian, you know, uh, just being selected, uh, we really haven't had an opportunity to come together or meet. Um, I think our first meeting is going to be the last week of March uh, in Indianapolis, and then we'll get some training uh, in August. And, you know, uh, when we get to uh, Dallas, uh, Bill Hancock and those guys, uh, they've done a great job. Certainly, it's a, it's not without challenge. Uh, when when you look at um, even the the Power Fives, you know, with four teams going, you know, somebody's going to be left out. But right. I think the media, I think the um, fan base, they are all more concerned than the actual coaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> when you uh, you know, they understand that it is about strength of schedule. Uh, it, it is about, you know, you know, all of the uh, things that go into and, and it's all, you know, it, luckily for us, it's all about the analytics. Um, all of that will come together, you know, through our uh, research. But, you know, it's all, it's never going to be without challenge, but I promise you, uh, 
uh, Bill Hancock and, his, and this group, um, it's all about integrity. And those conversations will continue to be with us. And we'll just continue to just have to work, just work through them. Right. Now, you've, you've fortunately, you've been a part of the NCAA Division II playoffs, the one double A, which is for that's for us old school folks, uh, which is now the FCS playoffs mm -hmm. uh, at Virginia Union and at Hampton. What have you experienced, uh, whether it be from a coach or administrative perspective? Uh, what are some of the positives or maybe challenges that you've experienced about whether it be the the, the process or being a part of those playoffs that uh, that that you think is a is a is something that can uh, uh, maybe be a benefit in your future discussions with people on that playoff committee? Well, again, you're talking about uh, the total programs. Um, you know, I should tell my guys and you know, my administrators, you know, until I, and this has all changed since the early days, but most of the time, uh, if you at the HBCU, um, you, you probably got to cut the projector off or the video in terms of game planning and go down the hall and teach a class. Uh, and I don't know if your opponent uh, has to do the same. So a, playing, a level playing field long before game day uh, has, has been a challenge. Mm. Uh, I think uh, what you see now in terms of uh, the leadership at our HBCUs uh, our coaches, our programs, uh, all of them have become uh, a lot more competitive because we, we are not saddled or bridled with all of these other responsibilities. And we can actually do the work of developing our young people, uh, you know, doing the analytics that's going to cause for a better game day preparation. Uh, so it's, it's a broad spectrum when you start talking about what happens on game day versus, because I always used to tell my players, uh, you can't be a champion on game day if you're not practicing to be a champion every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, from Sunday to game day, a lot goes into it. And if the playing field is level on Sunday, your opportunity to be successful on Saturday is going to be a, a lot greater. That's a that's a good point. Uh, the good that's a great message. Uh, you you mentioned teaching or or off or other non or other I guess other non coaching uh, duties. Did did you ever teach? And if so, what what courses did you teach while either at Virginia Union or Hampton? Well, when I was here in the eighties, uh, coaching at Virginia Union, uh, we had a full teaching load, mm. which was five classes. Wow. Uh, physical education, of course, and health. Um, at uh, Hampton, it was a physical ed class, uh, but you e evolved away from it. In fact, if you listen to uh, Willard Bailey, who has just been selected to uh, go into the Black Coaches Hall of Fame, uh, he talked about his whole career. Uh, he taught classes. And he preferred teaching classes because he wanted the players to see uh, that not only was he a coach, but he was an educator. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are benefits in doing so. It's just the idea of uh, if you're human, there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, a jack of all trade, but master of none. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's been a way of life. Uh, at the HBCU for years. Uh, but now, as I said before, uh, it has evolved into a profession because uh, I think they always looked at coaching as a ministry okay. because whenever you're trying to enhance the lives of others, uh, it is to me a ministry. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it. I've heard people say that. Uh, um, I, I've been a coach 20, 20, nearly 20 years of basketball. And I've heard people mention that word of coaching in ministry. So it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that. And, and it's so true. And oftentimes I probably myself or other people uh, at this level, high school level, maybe don't even 
often think of it that way, but but that's so true that you uh, bring that up. Well, the um, key is, you know, I always tell them that the good Lord didn't put you here to be a uniform rack. <laughs> you know, it's a lot more to you than that, but use the vehicle to set your goals high and, you know, understand that those same skills that makes you successful as, as an athlete certainly can propel you higher in terms of what you do in life as, as well. Right. Um, let, let me let me ask this one other sort of football related question. At, at 2020 saw a lot of shuffling of um, conference shuffling. We, we like to call it here the conference churning, where we had several schools uh, changing conferences uh, throughout the year, um, whether it be leaving the MEAC or moving into the SWAC. And we've even seen it at the NAIA level. Um, what, what are your thoughts as you've seen from your, from your viewpoint, some of the, some of the changes that are going on in the structure of conferences? Well, uh, yes, we did see movement and my first thought uh, and as I've looked at and also talked to different uh, commissioners, it, it's really an economical decision. Uh, when you look at FAM having to go all the way up to Delaware, when they can get on Route 10 and be in the uh, and, and go west, and you got 10 schools right, right, right there. Uh, so whenever you can cut down on the uh, cost or the expenditures for travel and hotels, uh, it, you're almost forced to do so because athletics is still a business. Uh, and, you know, you want to maximize and, you know, be as efficient as you can. And it also is an advantage for your fan base. Uh, again, they can get on Route 10 and go west a lot quicker than they can get on 95 or 85 and go north uh, so that you can have more, you know, fan support. So I think that's the number one uh, motivator for why you saw uh, some, some of this movement. Uh, now, there are other, because I didn't, I didn't see the visibility getting greater. Um, and then... But I think really it, it started with this idea of we are a business. Are we maximizing our resources? Is there any way we can save uh, in terms of, because it's still very expensive <laughs> to um, you know, have a, 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 an athletic program mm -hmm. uh, with 15 or 20 sports. And you know wherever you can find a way to what they call Six Sigma, uh, making sure that you eliminate waste. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you're being smart as administrators and as coaches. That's a good point. Good point. Um, speaking of or, or trying to transitioning a little bit towards Virginia Union in itself now. Um, my, my, my co-host, A.D. Drew, he, he brought up a, a good point that Virginia Union has, uh, he likes to think of Virginia Union as a basketball school. Now, I, I don't know how the public thinks of it, but obviously, given the fact that there have been seven, uh, and maybe more now, but we, we, we've notated seven professional basketball players who have come from Virginia Union, um, Ben Wallace, Charles Oakley, Mike Davis, Terry Davis, Bruce Spragans. Jamie Waller and AJ English. I don't know if I've missed any big names there, but with without basketball this year, um, you know, and, and of course your background being in football, what what has it been like in 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 the community without basketball this year, and, and just in general on campus for everyone without basketball this season? Yes. Well, uh, to be honest with you, uh, those names, yes. Um, they uh, came through and really created a real strong tradition uh, here at Virginia Union. In fact, uh, on the front door, uh, just above the door on our gym, uh, we have on it home of four national championships. 
Yes, sir. And I don't know how many universities can make that statement. Uh, so of course, and of course, that was under the legendary uh, Dave Robbins. So it's it's a uh, strong tradition. And uh, when I was asked to come out of retirement and take the job here as the AD, uh, Dr. Perkins asked that you know. I know you have retired, but I just need three years for you to come and organize my athletic department, get us back on track uh, for the great tradition. Because of course that was, he asked for three and this is number seven. So I don't know, somebody got the math uh, screwed up some kind of way, but uh, there are some outstanding, uh, you know, your Herb Scotts, uh, Leonard's, uh, Brim's, there's quite a few that have come through uh, as football players uh, and have gone on to the next level and done an outstanding job. So it's, it's a great tradition. And as you say, uh, being absent of that this fall, uh, we have sought to have what we call um, flashback Fridays. We have throwback Thursdays. Uh, the social media platforms have helped us to keep the fans and supporters uh, embraced by putting out uh, different forms of games from previous years. Uh, I think it was three years ago, we was in the national championship game with our women's basketball team. Uh, our track team has been doing some great things. Uh, of course, Coach Parker, our football coach, uh, Dr. Parker, rather, he played here and he's returned. And uh, we re we're really are proud of the things that he's doing. So we are still recruiting, still having small concept groups, still strength and conditioning, because very soon, as they said, soon and very soon, uh, we feel like we will return to competition. Uh, and whenever it comes, we will welcome it. First of all, I appreciate what you guys are doing uh, in terms of getting the word out, telling our story, because there are a lot of great stories. And even though this pandemic is real, uh, I'm very um, proud of the way uh, business has continued to move forward. Uh, our HBCUs, I think, will come back even stronger than they were before. Uh, you look up and you see a lot of philanthropic uh, efforts uh, moving forward. And I think as a result, uh, people are really seeing the uh, very fine work that goes on at our HBCUs. And we appreciate you guys for what you do to put the story out there. Yes, sir. Well, hey, again, thank you for your time and congratulations again on the selection. And we look forward to to hearing more uh, in the future. And uh, we, we want everyone at Virginia Union to, to continue to stay safe. Uh, you and your family be well. And um, we're praying that we get back to some kind of normalcy for a great 2021-22 season. Yes, we will. We will get through it all together. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you, coach, for your time. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Network. Tell everybody they can follow their dreams. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dashboard, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Gaville's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. This is Brian Fulford. AD Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap 
YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. 